All right, boys, in the 11.4% of you that are either girls or non-binary, today I want to talk about Ghostface from Dead by Daylight and why his lore has become one of my favorites in the entire game. Ghostface has always been a really interesting character in DBD, and his new lore from Tome 13 Malevolence has made him at least like four times cooler. Much like how the Scream franchise addresses the impact of horror fiction on the public, Danny Johnson's story provides a fair amount of commentary on that weird serial killer stand culture that we see going on, especially with the surge in popularity of true crime entertainment. If you go around showing people the ghost face mask and ask them where it's from, first of all, they'll probably think you're weird for shoving a mask in their face, but beyond that, the vast majority of people will say, yeah, that's, that's the guy from Scream. The more cultured folks will say, it's the guy from Scary Movie, and then they'll go, Huzzah! And it's all for good reason. Scream is an iconic horror franchise, providing a meta spin on the genre. Instead of an absolute force of nature tearing through human after human, the killers are just regular ass humans who trip over things and bumble their way through their kills. The scares come from the fact that it's somebody who's known to the victims, but they're not quite sure who's behind the mask yet. Their motives range from IDK LMAO, to I want to inspire better horror movies, to I will commit a string of murders until I am inevitably caught and then I will place the blame on gratuitously violent horror films just to see if I can get away with it. It's, it's amazing. However, while these movies may have popularized the mask, the rights holders to Scream are not the ones who hold the rights to this look. That would be Bridget Slyerton and Fun World. Therefore, Behavior had the unique opportunity to use an iconic character look, but tweak it to create something original not tied to the Scream franchise in any way, shape, or form. And thus, Danny Johnson was born. And while he does have a lot in common with the ghost faces we're used to, he's something a lot darker and sinister and kind of more tuned to what Dead by Daylight's vibe is. As I mentioned, the Scream franchise features a variety of people behind the mask, and the scary part is the paranoia of trying to figure out who it is behind the mask. Behind the mask, they're just aggressively average and uncoordinated people. Danny Johnson, on the other hand, despises when he has to improvise a kill. He's a very calculating person who prides himself on spending sometimes months planning the perfect design for his kills before making a move. Everything is meticulously choreographed well in advance because he knows his victims' routines and behaviors inside and out, and he plans for every contingency. The scary part about him isn't who's behind the mask, we already know that. It's Danny. The scary part is what he's capable of when the mask goes on. Danny Johnson was born sometime in the mid 20th century in or around the state of Utah, which automatically disqualifies him from being the weirdest person in his community. At a young age, Danny's father would sit him down and tell him all of his war stories. He would describe in great detail all the enemies he had killed and exactly how he did it. He would also put his son through rigorous combat drills. His hope was to inspire little Danny to follow in his footsteps. However, to Danny, these war stories weren't really stories of glory and honor. They were stories of horror and theatrics. He listened to these stories and thought, you know, I could probably do the same thing, but maintain my bodily autonomy and not enlist. So instead of becoming a man who hunted the enemies of his country, Danny became a man who hunted whoever he felt would make the most interesting story in tomorrow's paper. To Danny, he wasn't the one who wore a mask, everyone else was. He viewed society and civilization as feeble human attempts to cover up and stave off our true nature, a sinister and violent nature. To him, regular people put on the mask by living a peaceful life and pretending everything is okay. And when the mask came off was when the true horror was revealed. These people are the insane ones, not him. An example of why he thinks this is how the news is front loaded with all the violent and scary stories and they scatter in just a couple feel good ones here and there. And all of this is funded by advertisers. We see those terrible things on the news and we thank our lucky stars that it's not us. Rather than being a horror junkie like the ghost faces of the Scream franchise, you know, the ones who are obsessed with Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger, Danny was obsessed with the horrors that actually happened in his world. There's even a hint in his tome lore that he took inspiration from other Dead by Daylight killers and their stories from what they did before they were taken by the entity. Much like how the Scream killers are meta takes on people obsessed with horror movies, Danny Johnson almost seems to be a take on true crime junkies and to an extent, a meta take on DBD lore enthusiasts. Not me though, I'm safe, I promise. It's, it's pixel bush that you have to look out for. Anyway, as I was saying, Danny relishes the horrors of daily life and he fondly remembers a debate that he had with his anthropology professor where his professor repeatedly brought up the good things humanity has done, 
like electricity in the turn of the century, and Danny countered with how those same things were almost immediately used to commit atrocities shortly after their inception, like the electric chair and World War I. And these things were soaking the world with blood and horror. Which, if he went to college in Utah, as he seems to have done, he's worried about the wrong kind of soaking, if you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, you're going to have to pause to read this. By this time, Danny had probably already made his first kill. He described it as an emotional event, one where he had to improvise and flounder a lot, which are things that he tried to avoid in his subsequent kills. Danny's modus operandi involved settling into a town, taking on a new identity, picking victims almost randomly based on who he thought would strike more fear into the general public, and taking them down only after he's designed the perfect kill to terrorize the victim and those who read about it later. His murders puzzled authorities because they were so disconnected from each other, yet they seemed so personal and violent, almost as if they were crimes of passion. And in a sense, they were crimes of passion. To Danny, he was telling a story to the townspeople, much like the stories that his father told him. He did this in numerous towns across the United States, with three specifically being mentioned. An unnamed town in Utah, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Roseville, Florida. Particular attention is given to Roseville in the Ghostface's lore, as that is the final town that he operated in before being taken by the entity. In Roseville, Danny operated under the alias of Jed Olson, there he worked for the local publication, the Roseville Gazette. His job was to interview the loved ones of those who died to the ghost face. By remaining close to the case, he was able to see firsthand exactly how his stories were being received. Tome 13 gives a close-up of Danny's mindset. In Roseville, he's trying to pick out who his next victim is going to be, and he specifically wants to go after somebody who doesn't deserve to die. No criminal record, not being known for being an annoying neighbor, just an average Joe. He wanted his readers to feel that there was nowhere for them to hide. If it could happen to this random guy with no enemies, it could happen to them as well. He went through his notebook of all the people that he had stalked until he found somebody that fit the bill, an anthropology professor named John Michael. After scouting out his nightly routine and planning everything down to how many times he's going to make noises around John's house before revealing himself, the ghost of Roseville makes his move. However, in the middle of performing his story, Danny noticed in John's house a local publication in which they make fun of the ghost with an over-exaggerated caricature of his mask. Here we find out that Danny's weakness is not being taken seriously. He had allowed a drunken victim to escape so he could go and tell the tale and spread the story only for people to make fun of the ghost face. It threw him off center and blighted him with rage. The emotion reminded him of his sloppy first kill, the one he swore to never repeat. As such, he nearly got caught by John Michaels and then decided to just abort the mission outright. He refused to go through with a plan that couldn't be executed perfectly. He wanted it to sound good when a podcaster talks about an unfortunate soul's timely demise just after doing an ad read for Me Undies. Speaking of ad reads, skip to this time code if you want to continue the video. This video has no sponsor, but the channel now has channel memberships. For just $2 a month, you can support the channel and get some pretty neat perks like seeing videos a day before everyone else, being a part of an exclusive Discord chat if you're 18 or older, cute little emotes, and being shouted out in my videos. Right now we have one channel member. His name is Marsh. I've known Marsh for about a year and a half. He's a good young lad. So Marsh, this one's for you. Cause he's my best friend, he's my pal. He's my homeboy, my rotten soldier. He's my sweet cheese, my good time boy. Now back to the video. So Danny decided that instead of killing the anthropology professor John Michaels, he wanted to find those responsible for the utter disrespect he had to endure with that caricature. They were editors of a paper called The Urban Farce. So all he had to do was stake out the local post office, find out who visited the paper's P.O. box, and then let the stalking begin. With this method, he found three deadbeat college dropouts who worked at the local coliseum. Their names were Tom, Pete, and Bradley. He learned their routine inside and out. They'd lock up the location, they'd clean, take inventory, just chat in the staff room while working on their crappy newspaper, down a couple of beers, play laser tag for about 22 minutes, return to the staff room, gather the things, and go home. The ghost of Roseville decided that he would need to skulk through the coliseum a few times to figure out the perfect design for their story. However, while scouting out the location, he overheard Tom, Pete, and Bradley doing what they do best, belittling people like Danny. They started picking apart all the flaws they saw in horror movie icons as well as real life killers. I mean real life killers like in their reality, not in our reality. And even the ghost face himself. 
They spoke about what they would do if they were to become mass murderers, and even started loosely planning out what they could do to be a better Ghostface than Ghostface. Danny had half a mind to kill them right then and there, half a mind to postpone his plan so he could watch them try and fail to become iconic killers, and half a mind to just stay the plan, scout out the area, and kill them in a few days once he had it all planned out. If you're keeping track at home, that's three halves of a mind right there. However, all that changed when they went to play their daily game of laser tag like the epic adults they were, and the ghost face scouted out the staff room. On the wall, he found caricatures of his favorite killers throughout history. The lore specifically mentioned someone called The Miner, which I'm almost positive is what the Trapper became known as in his reality after he committed his mass murder. So while this isn't 100% confirmed, I'd like to imagine that Danny is essentially the in-universe DVD lore enthusiast, obsessing over the murders committed by killers like the Trapper and the Clown and seeing them as inspiration. So into the laser tag arena he went. For Danny, the next 10 minutes were just a blur of blood, strobe lights, and screams. When he came to, Bradley had been stabbed in the face over 100 times and was now just a bloody pulp, Pete was decapitated a few meters away, and Tom was trying to crawl away but was losing blood fast and Danny's mask was nowhere to be found. Danny noted that this had gone very poorly, just like his first kill when he got angry at his father and improvised the whole kill on him. However, to Danny, this was just something that happens to the best of us. We all get flustered at times and we all screw up at work. It's all good, man. And so Danny contemplated how he was going to spin this. He didn't want to attribute such a sloppy emotional episode to the ghost of Roseville. His two ideas were either to stage it as if Tom tried to be a ghost face copycat by killing his friends, or that it was just a prank bro and it went horribly wrong. In the end, he decided that it didn't matter and he would let his readers decide for themselves what it meant. This is where Danny's tome lore ends, but it's not the end of his story. Shortly after this, the clues from all of his murders started to point towards someone. Jed Olson, the random guy that worked at the Roseville Gazette. The cheerful, charming guy who was hired despite not having any known work history. While he was an adept killer, Danny wasn't perfect. One of his add-ons is a chewed up pen that he left at a crime scene and the police didn't notice, but if they had, then they probably could have deduced it was him a lot sooner. As they started to close in on him with the investigation, Danny decided that it was time to cut his losses, hit the gritty, and get the hell out of there. He left a note on his work desk. I hope you liked my stories. I enjoyed bringing them to life. Don't worry, I'm not done. As Danny basked in the stories he had told in Roseville, he plotted where he'd go next for the sequel. He had no idea that the location was already picked out for him. While he contemplated, he was covered in a thick mist and taken to a new realm. As he heard the screams of his next victim, he immediately set to work. As I said before, I think this new tome adds so much to the character of Danny Johnson. We knew he was a twisted, cold, and calculating individual with a goofy side and a love of theatrics. But if tome 13 shows us anything, it's that Danny does what he does to tell a story to his community. He wants everybody to know that however tight they put on the mask of civility and however much they lie to themselves and tell themselves that the world is okay, they could be next.